Okay. Hello, everybody. Hello, Igor. Yes, the answer is I just pushed the recording. We will record this session. Welcome, everybody. Uh, this is a session on the Open Policy Network. We'll talk about what that is. And we will, really the purpose of the session is to get feedback from all of you on what you think of the idea and how we might make it better and hopefully to get you involved in the project itself. And so before we get started, let's do just a quick round of introductions. If everyone would uh, please type in the chat window and uh, let us know um, where you're from, wh what country you're in, what you do, and maybe what your interest is in open education or open policy. So I'll do that as well. So my name is Cable Green. I'm the Director of Global Learning at Creative Commons. <coughs> and as you can tell, I'm fighting a cold, so I apologize in advance for any coughing that I do during the session. And uh, my particular interest in open education comes out of uh, 15 years of working in higher education, both in universities, uh, at the state level, in the United States, and also with community colleges. And I became particularly interested in open education uh, when I realized that there were many people uh, in the United States and around the world who simply could not get access to a higher education. And uh, and big reason they couldn't get access was they couldn't afford a higher education. And a big part of that was the cost of the resources they were using in the class. Uh, another reason I got involved in this is I became rather disgusted with the inefficiency of public education in the United States and the redundancy and lack of sharing that occurs. And then I became uh, particularly interested once I had children. I now have two boys uh, and they are in kindergarten and the second grade or preschool in the second grade. And the resources that they have in their schools are on average 10 years old, and I don't find that acceptable in the 21st century given the tools we have. So let's see, we've got uh, Igor, we've got Henry. Uh, for everybody else who's just joined us, if you'd, uh, great, just type in uh, where you're from and uh, your interest in OER, great, thank you. So I have slides, but I'm thinking that it will be more interesting if we just talk a little bit and share some links. Uh, but I do want to start with, uh, with one slide. Uh, so some of you may know uh, Basel. Uh, Basel's been in, um, in a prison in Syria for uh, one year with no charges brought against him. He's a longtime Creative Commons volunteer and the leader of the Creative Commons Syria affiliate uh, team in uh, Damascus. And his imprisonment uh, for now over a year, or almost a year, is a reminder that all of us are not just working uh, for a free, freer internet, but we're working for a freer world. And our actions have consequences. Uh, in this case, the, uh, the government of Syria uh, was not interested in the, the freedoms uh, and the sharing of knowledge that Basel was advocating for. So um, just a heads up that this is one year that he's been in prison. He's in a military prison. Uh, and if you're interested in learning more, the website is there at freebossel.org. So we don't want to forget our colleagues who uh, fight these same fights that we discussed today. And, um, and we want to remember him and continue to work for his release. <laughs> Um, as I said, I may jump back to some slides from time to time, but mostly I want to have a conversation. So uh, feel free to raise your hand. Uh, we can, you will have you grab the mic. If you just have a question that you want to type in, that's okay too. Um, by the way, if anybody's having trouble with my audio, uh, please let me know in the chat and I'll turn off the video. And that will uh, reduce the bandwidth pull. Uh, so, before I jump into the Open Policy Network, <laughs> before I jump into open policy, let's first talk about why uh, open policy is even important and how it relates to open education because this is Open Education Week. So 
So let's start with open education. A big part of, uh, in order for open education to happen, we need uh, all sorts of things. But one of the things we need are open education resources, uh, both content, but we also need resources in the form of support. We need uh, training and professional development. And we need, <laughs> in many cases, permission to spend our time doing certain types of activities that would support open education. And so uh, one of the things that we all think about when we need resources is we think about money. And we follow the money and we try to figure out how do we get grants or some of our time at work or maybe uh, our particular agency <laughs> or institution or government to provide us a grant to do a particular activity around open education. So this idea has percolated in the community and we've all uh, scrounged and scratched and, and tried to find money where we can. Uh, on, at the same time, the open educational resources movement and the open ed movement in general <coughs> is approximately 10 years old and governments have started to pay attention. And they've paid attention for many reasons. One reason is that uh, open education increases affordability and access to educational opportunities in primary, secondary, and tertiary education. Governments are interested in that. Uh, governments uh, are concerned with the high cost of textbooks. They're paying attention to that. Governments are also very interested in the uh, what happens when you take the internet as a distribution mechanism and you take all this digital content that we use in education and you start to talk about open licensing and all of a sudden you can have conversations about sharing knowledge and sharing research and sharing data and textbooks and courseware for the marginal cost of zero. So there are still production costs, there are still maintenance costs to so all these things. But once that digital object is created, to store it, to distribute it, and to make copies of it cost almost zero. Governments are looking at that and saying, that's interesting. And to the extent that we, the government, only has so much money to put on education, maybe we should start to use these tools these tools being the internet, cloud computing, the affordances of digital things, open licensing, et cetera, to increase access, improve quality, give more options to our teachers and professors in public education, and of course, the students. <laughs> so governments have started to ask these questions. Open policy, very simply, is publicly funded resources should be openly licensed resources. The idea there being that if the public paid for something, the public should get access to it. So all of us in our countries that we live in, we pay taxes. And some of those taxes go uh, into education budgets in the governments, and then governments give out grants or they provide other financial support to purchase educational resources, et cetera, in our education institutions. They also, by the way, give out big chunks of money for research to be done. And there's a whole other sister movement called open access that deals with that, making sure that government-funded scientific research and the articles, the academic articles that come out of that research are also freely and openly available to the public that pay for them. <laughs> so, so you get the idea. Governments are starting to look at this and saying, ha, huh, maybe we should have a policy. Maybe we should have a law in our country that says when we spend public money building an education resource, that resource should have an open license on it. And I'll give a quick overview of Creative Commons open licensing in a minute. If anybody, uh, anybody needs that, we'll take a quick poll here and see how much time we should spend on that. So, so that's point number one. Governments are, are thinking about this. They're, they're having this conversation and they're asking questions. Point number two is that's where the money is. So the, the, yes, the foundations of the world, Shuttleworth, the Wellcome Trust, 
Hewlett, Gates, Sloan, and you name it. There's lots of foundations out there. <laughs> yes, they have a lot of money. Yes, they have billions of dollars, and those are impressive numbers. And yes, they have funded the open education movement for a decade now. And we thank them for that, and they will continue to support our efforts. But that's not where the real money is. The real money, the big money, is in governments. That's point number two. Point number three is should, from an ethical and moral and fiduciary responsibility standpoint, should the public get access to what it paid for? Should governments be efficient with the tools that they have to maximize education access? Most people would say yes. Most policymakers are saying yes. So, so I share that story. That kind of sets the stage. <coughs> Excuse me. Kind of sets the stage for why we're talking about this thing called an open policy network. So let me uh, bear with me just a second here. I'm going to put something up on the screen. <laughs> okay, and then uh, you should see that on the screen, and it should also be in your chat window. So, uh, so what this is is a uh, really a one pager, a beginning set of ideas around uh, what the open policy network is and why it might exist. So let me back up a few steps. We already talked about what's happening with the tools that are available. We talked about what governments are starting to think about. Uh, what the next thing that happened is governments are starting to ask for help. So governments around the world are saying, okay, we understand the internet and digital stuff and Creative Commons licensing, but how do we build a policy? What might uh, some model legislation look like? Who's going to love this idea and who's going to hate this idea? Who will attack it? Uh, what will the commercial textbook publishing industry in my country say about a policy like this? Um, what will their arguments be? What should my counter arguments be? What are the talking points that I need? Uh, you get the idea. They're asking for a toolkit. They want videos. They want, uh, they want frankly, uh, a group of us, uh, many of us who are, uh, who are on this webinar, uh, to be able to get on an airplane with 48 hours notice and be in Mozambique next week to be able to testify to their legislature about open textbooks because that's the conversation they want to have, but they want uh, other countries to come talk who have already worked with open textbooks. This is what governments are asking for. Uh, and so we heard this at Creative Commons loud and clear uh, in the fall of 2011, uh, Creative Commons has affiliate teams all over the world. We have uh, 70 teams in different countries in the world, and I believe we've got them in every country that's listed here uh, when you all introduced yourself. Our Creative Commons affiliates come together face-to-face -to -face every two years, and I was brand new two years ago, and I said, what should I do? I'm brand new. And they said, they said several things, but one of the things they said was you should do this. Our governments need help thinking about open policies, creating open policies, adopting and implementing open policies, and then seeing them through to ensure compliance of those open policies. And so we said, okay, we hear you loud and clear. Um, Creative Commons is not the only organization that should be leading this because there are many organizations around the world that are thinking about open policy, understand the importance of it, and the leverage point that open policy provides. Because let's be straight, we're talking about releasing hundreds of billions of dollars of education and scientific resources onto the web with an open license when they're funded with public money. That's what we're talking about. And so we're fundamentally talking about changing the level of access in a significant way to the resources that people need to teach and to learn. 
And so what we did is we reached out globally to partners around the world, including the Open Courseware Consortium and Spark that's working on open access and the PERGs that are working on open textbooks. Those are student public interest groups and Free Software Foundation in Europe and the Open Knowledge Foundation in England and you name it. We pulled together 30 or 40 different organizations, including UNESCO and OECD, and we talked with um, many IGOs as well. <coughs> and we had this conversation. And out of this conversation came this document. And I'm not going to go through it in detail, but if you want to, you've got the URL. And what you'll see is uh, we walked through, this group created uh, a rationale for why this should exist. Um, a mission statement, some guiding principles that will guide our actions. Uh, and then we also talked about an, what we call an operational work plan. So this is really about when an open policy opportunity comes to the network, what do we do with it? So if Mozambique calls next week and says, uh, boy, we've got an opportunity with open textbooks, who can help us? Uh, and what should we do and what resources do we need and how do we capitalize on this opportunity so that we can have an open policy in Mozambique. Uh, we're, we have a kind of a triage system for how that opportunity uh, gets, gets assessed, gets prioritized, and then gets given to the part of the network that can best support the request. One of the principles of the open policy network is that local uh, talent and local networks reign supreme. So if there, so let's use Mozambique for an example. Uh, OER Africa is an incredible organization that focuses on open educational resources and it would make no sense to send somebody from the Open Knowledge Foundation from England to Mozambique if somebody from Nairobi from OER Africa could get to Mozambique quicker and had a better understanding of the regional issues that Mozambique was dealing with around open textbooks. And so we, we had this discussion and, uh, and we've got some rough ideas of how that will work. Uh, we talked about governance. This is um, really a network, so this is not a top-down uh, organization. The, uh, the decision actually was to go with option one here, to have a loose coalition for the time being. And so essentially what we will do is have monthly conference calls. We will have a listserv. Uh, and there, to the extent that we have big changes in work that we're doing or any, any principles that change, that will, uh, the whole group will come together and vote on those activities just as they have to produce the overall structure of the network. Uh, and then we, uh, toward the bottom here, we've got a list of uh, work that we intend to do, both short term and medium term. And this is, these are really tactical projects that are meant to be resources that we're producing to make available to governments around the world. And when I say governments, let me be clear, we're talking about national governments, provincial and state and regional governments. We're also talking about uh, systems of education and in some cases individual uh, education uh, or other institutions that might want to implement a policy. And so I'll let you read through those uh, and you get an idea of what we will be uh, creating and producing. And then, of course, the, the last point here is funding. You can't do anything without money. And so already the organizations <coughs> who are participating are uh, contributing parts of people's time, uh, and people are working that into their schedules, and so that's great. Uh, and uh, Creative Commons and, uh, and other orgs are already seeking uh, additional funding so that we can fund individual parts of these, uh, of these work products. So for example, one of the things that people want to do in the network is to have open policy network fellows. And we'd like to have fellows all around the world. And these would be people who would be paid a stipend to dedicate a significant amount of their time to focus on a very narrow project that is a gap in open policy research or open policy data or open policy work that needs to be done, but the rest of the network just doesn't have the time or it can commit the effort to do it. And so we've got several of those projects which, uh, which take money and we're looking for, for funding as well. 
that is where the network is at this point. Let me uh, pause for a minute and just look for questions in the chat window. And then what I'll do next is to, uh, to go through and show you some of the open policies which have already taken hold around the world uh, and show that we're off to a good start. So I'll pause for just a minute. If you've got a question, go ahead and uh, type it in the chat window or you can raise your hand. There's a little hand above the participant window if you want to uh, talk and I'll get off the microphone. Okay, uh, let's see here. Frank says, is it possible for a private donation? Uh, yes, uh, always. <laughs> so, yeah, we will, um, yeah, we will have a little, probably a little uh, PayPal donate thing on the website as we spin up the Open Policy uh, Network website. Uh, yes, uh, we anticipate that most of the funding will come from foundations uh, out of the gates. But one of the conversation that we will be uh, having is as governments come to these, uh, this network and, and ask for help, uh, we will in turn ask, uh, that's great that you want to have an open policy on that grant. Uh, is there technical assistance money available to help implement that grant? And oftentimes there is. And uh, so we may say, well, to the extent that your grant has a open licensing requirement on it, and uh, you may need assistance with implementation and helping people understand what a Creative Commons license is, et cetera. Might you consider providing uh, a little bit of funding so that we can assist you in helping you make that policy successful? And uh, many governments have said, you know, yes, we're very interested in that, that conversation. Okay, uh, let me go ahead and uh, I'll keep watching for questions uh, and, uh, and we'll go from there. So, <laughs> excuse me, uh, let me put another URL in the chat. So um, here's one uh, interesting resource. Uh, this is called the OER Policy Registry. Um, this is simply uh, what it says. It's a, it's a very simple database of uh, open education resources, resource policies all around the world. And you can come in and, and say, uh, sort these by country, or by um, whether or not they're current, uh, they've been implemented, or they've just been proposed, uh, or what uh, jurisdiction types are these global policies, national, state, uh, education, et cetera. There are similar repositories like RoarMap around uh, open access policies as well. The point here being is that the Open Policy Network will not produce anything that already exists. Rather, what we will do is we will curate and aggregate open policy resources like this and make them easily available and, and hopefully that they make sense, uh, both through the Open Policy Network website uh, and also, um, also when we give out toolkits and provide uh, consulting and, and information. So let me provide just a few examples uh, and I'll, I'll put all of these in the, uh, in the chat window so that you've got the links um, of what's happening. And uh, th this is actually real. There are open policy opportunities springing up all over the place. Um, here's a recent one, and these are just uh, Creative Commons blog posts where you'll find links out to the relevant open policies and, and the organizations that are working on them. Um, there's a lot happening in the European Union right now. And uh, this is just one, the EC, um, as you probably all saw, uh, recently put out a, uh, an open consulting period on something that they called opening up education. And they're having a broad conversation in the European Union about what open education means and what they should be thinking about. And they are actually thinking about EU policies um, that would be uh, strong recommendations from them to their member states but also requirements on their grants. So the EU and the EC give out a lot of money uh, to, to their member states, and they themselves are thinking about uh, putting open policies on their grants. Uh, here's another one that many of you are, are probably familiar with. This is out of uh, UNESCO and the Commonwealth of Learning. <laughs> this was 
uh, occurred last June uh, at UNESCO headquarters in Paris. It's called the 2012 Paris OER Declaration. This was all of UNESCO's member uh, nations coming together and having a three-day discussion about open education. And at the end of it, there was unanimous consent uh, to support um, the principles in the Paris OER Declaration. And you can see them listed here in the blog post. Uh, this is a powerful tool in that it gives a structure and a set of talking points and a reference point for most of the countries in the world to say, yes, I am a UNESCO member. They have passed a declaration. These are the types of things that my government should be working on. And I'm going to highlight one thing here and drop it in the chat. Whoops. Let's see if I can try that again here. Copy, paste. There we go. So if you look at J, it says encourage the open licensing of educational materials produced with public funds. That's open policy. That's what we're talking about. And so that's, that's another example. Let me give you an example from uh, the state that I live in. I live in Washington State here in the United States. <coughs> and I'll drop this one in the chat window. Uh, this was um, a reaction to our elementary education system and the fact that our resources are 10 years out of date and that we find that unacceptable in our state. And so this was a bill that passed last year um, that provides money, uh, public money, to the Department of Education to help educate all of the teachers in the state and all of the school districts and the superintendents uh, of the state and other uh, legislators as well. And they provided 250,000 US dollars, so not a lot of money, but it was enough money to hire a few staff and to provide some travel money and have conferences to pull people together to talk about using open education. So this was a government that put, a state government that put a relatively small amount of money but is having um, a, a big effect. Uh, I can tell you we've had one conference so far uh, and I've already uh, received 10 invitations to go to school districts uh, around my state to talk more because they want to adopt open textbooks and they want to, in fact, enact their own open policies that says from now on when we, when we the teachers, when we the curriculum directors of our schools build content, we also should be putting a Creative Commons license on our works so that not only we can use it and people across the state can use it, uh, without infringing on copyright, but more to the point, anyone in the world can use these resources. Uh, here's another example uh, from the United States. Let me put that in the chat window. <laughs> this is the state of California. Uh, they have, they passed two bills this past year that is taking five million dollars, so now we're talking about uh, bigger dollars, uh, five million dollars to produce uh, Creative Commons licensed open textbooks. And so uh, this is an impressive amount of money. They are targeting their highest enrolled courses and uh, those textbooks uh, should be available within a year or so. The challenge here is that the, um, the money has to be matched uh, before the public dollars are available. So there's a catch in here. And, we have to find now donors to match that $5 million and, uh, but essentially it's a challenge grant. And so in the end, hopefully, uh, they will have $10 million to put out RFPs and build those open textbooks. Now there's an important open policy point here. One of the attacks by, uh, by the publishing industry is mm -hmm. to say, uh, governments, you should not be competing with us. Governments, you should not be building educational content. You have no expertise. You have no business in the market. In fact, you're disrupting the market. Uh, the California's response to that is, we're not building anything. What we are doing as a government is we are looking at the state of educational resources and the state of education access uh, in our state. And in California, there are approximately 
450,000 students today who cannot get into college. And one of the reasons that they can't get in is that there's no space for them. Another reason uh, that they can't get in is the money isn't there. And another reason that it's challenging for many students to get in is the cost of textbooks in California, and this is true of, they have the same cost of textbooks as everybody else, but the cost of textbooks is the same amount of money as the cost of tuition in their community colleges. The government simply said, this is unacceptable. And so what we are going to do as the, as the government is to provide some money. That money will be available to anybody in open competitive RFPs to build textbooks. But because it's our money, because the public paid this money in tax dollars, what is produced will be openly licensed. If you don't like those terms, don't apply to the RFP to build the textbooks. <coughs> Couple other examples and then I'll jump back to questions here. <coughs> Here's British Columbia. Uh, very similar to California. They looked at their, um, their state of textbooks and how much they cost and the fact that many of their students um, did not, do not buy textbooks when they go to their college courses and they said this is not acceptable. And we as a government will provide money and support to, uh, to create up to 40 open textbooks and we will also make those available under a Creative Commons attribution license. It's worth noting that both uh, California and British Columbia, given that their projects are so similar, they will actually be meeting in a few weeks along with Alberta and many of the big open textbook providers including CK12 and uh, OpenStax and Siabula from South Africa and several others uh, to make sure that they're not recreating the wheel. So even though they have money and they've committed to build open textbooks, we're going to sit down and have a conversation with them uh, to basically say, uh, let's first lay out what you need. Let's look at what exists in the world today. Ask the question, can you use or could you modify and make new works, derivative works of those uh, existing textbooks so that we don't have to spend public money building those. And then let's look at where the gaps are. So what doesn't exist that you need that we can also openly license and make available to everyone else in the world. And then the total collection of open textbooks that we have available for the world grows. So that's a conversation we'll be having, having in a few weeks. Uh, here is, oh, I didn't put that one in the chat window. Let me do that. Here's another case that <laughs> has a sad story, a sad end to it. Um, there for years there has been work in uh, Brazil, really excellent work led by uh, Carol Carolina Rossini and OER Brazil and several other uh, really great players. And uh, what they have done is worked on open access and OER and other uh, other initiatives in Brazil, but they've been very uh, progressive and active in the open policy arena. So they've been having national conversations with the legislature and also conversations with cities and states. And so the city of Sao Paulo um, has passed an open policy that essentially says anything that's produced with, with uh, city funds has a Creative Commons license on it. They then went to the state of Sao Paulo. And the state of Sao Paulo, if you look at your map, is massive. It's, uh, it's almost as big as the United States. Uh, it's a very large uh, territory and it is also the, I believe, the, the wealthiest territory in Brazil. And they, um, they worked on an open policy for the state of Sao Paulo. And the policy, the legislation uh, that actually passed, as you can see in this blog post, uh, required a Creative Commons license on all of the educational resources that were produced with state funds. And so this was, this was huge. This was a very big open policy uh, with a lot of money behind it. Unfortunately, uh, the governor of the state uh, vetoed the bill. And what we came to find out is the governor of the state uh, has a history of vetoing bills from the legislature and in fact has vetoed 90% of the bills that have come from the legislature uh, to the governor's desk. So this was less a case of 
uh, a bad open policy or an open policy that didn't have support. This is a, an internal political uh, uh, battle going on between the governor and the state legislature, hopefully. Uh, and, and they even went to the governor and said, oh, why did you veto the bill? And it had nothing to do with the open policy. The governor likes the open policy. The governor is in a uh, power uh, discussion with the legislature, shall we say. Uh, and then uh, let me give uh, just a few more examples here. I think we're okay on time. <laughs> here is one from, there we go, one from Poland. English URL, there we go, there's the, there's the link. Um, that goober with the picture, that's, that's me with my Poland hat on. Uh, Poland um, had a situation, has a situation where uh, primary school students in Poland, not all of them have access to textbooks. The government decided that that was unacceptable. Uh, Poland, as you know, is a, um, a rising power in Europe. Uh, Poland's uh, president is uh, either the next president of the EU, maybe he's already the president of the EU, I haven't checked recently. Uh, and uh, Creative Commons has a really incredible team in Poland uh, led by uh, Alec Tarkowski and, and his colleagues, and they went to the uh, to the president's office and they went to the uh, worked with their Ministry of Education and put together an entire package that was more than just about open textbooks. It was about uh, information uh, communication technology. It was about equipment. It was about uh, it was also about textbooks, and they put together. Um, an annual grant, and I'll let you read the details, but the net result is that the government will take public money, give it to a third party nonprofit, and then that nonprofit will create an RFP for the creation <coughs> of open textbooks, and all of those textbooks will have a Creative Commons license on them so that they will be available to everyone at no cost in Poland and modifiable. Uh, but they're also available to the rest of us. And uh, my, my hope is that uh, there will be projects all around the world to translate those books from Polish to Spanish and French and uh, Chinese and Japanese and whatever language may be useful uh, to your nation and to your students. We will certainly be looking at translation projects uh, for schools here in, in my state, I can tell you that. Um, here is Another one, which uh, since our good friends from the Open Courseware Consortium are hosting Open Education Week, and we thank them for doing so, <laughs> I'll use a institution example of an open policy. So here is an uh, a, a institution in India. This is the National Program on Technology Enhanced Learning, and they have adopted, as you can see on their page, uh, Creative Commons licenses on all of their courses. And so this idea of open policy need not be limited to, uh, to governments. It can happen at individual institutions as well, and we benefit from those greatly. Uh, and then just one last example um, to show how you can make uh, small progress as well. This is, uh, let me publish that out. If you look down at the bottom here, this is the uh, U.S. State Department Fulbright program where they send uh, Fulbright scholars around the world uh, where, they're, uh, where they're needed or where someone has asked for help. And so if you're not familiar with this program, um, uh, countries have embassies all around the world, as we know. Uh, the United States does as well. And uh, people can walk into a U.S. embassy and say, I would like assistance with X. I would like help with uh, farming or with agriculture science, or uh, now they can walk in and say, I would like help with open education. <laughs> and the, the uh, U.S. Department of State has a new program where they will actually fund open education experts to get matched with those requests, and they will pay your expenses to travel around the world and work with, uh, with other people who want help with open educational resources. And so, you know, and this is not, <laughs> not a lot of money. Um, you're not talking about significant impact, uh, but nevertheless, um, small incremental steps that governments can make. 
So let me stop here with examples and I'm going to come back and look at the questions. <laughs> so Igor, our good friend from OCWC says, uh, from an institution point of view, government funding has been significantly slashed due to a number of factors. As a result of that, many institutions are forced to look for alternative revenue streams such as carrying out research projects commissioned by private companies. <laughs> I think it will be an important to engage with various funding agencies on this issue, open policies as well, and of course national foundations and similar bodies. Yes, uh, excellent points and in fact let me uh, put up one more example here. We'll see here, Creative Commons White House. <coughs> Uh, here, I found it. Okay, so you may, so I'm going to jump over to open access for just a moment. Put this link up here. So just uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, the White House in the United States put out a directive to 19 federal agencies that said, from now on, when you spend the public's money, on research. So when you give grants to anyone to do research, after 12 months, uh, after publication, uh, those research articles must be freely available to the public. Now they also have a discussion about reuse rights uh, that's happening uh, so that uh, hopefully we can get open licensing on these as well so that you can data mine and text mine the articles and do other things with them that do require an open license, but nevertheless, this is a good first step. And so this is the kind of thing that governments are starting to ask, is what can they do to ensure the maximum return on, <laughs> return on investment for the public's dollar? <coughs> Kevin asks, can you share how you will be working with Lumen Learning, David Wiley's new OER initiative in terms of working with this group to educate people about textbook zero. <laughs> yes, so let me, um, let me bring up their website here. So here is Lumen Learning. They just uh, announced their, <laughs> their new company this week. Excuse me. So essentially what Lumen Learning is, is um, David Wiley and a woman named Kim Thanos and a few other people who are passionate OER advocates, they decided that the next thing that is needed for the OER ecosystem is, <coughs> is companies like Red Hat uh, around Linux or Moodle rooms around Moodle. The idea is there are open things out there. There's open source software. There's open educational resources. These things have open licenses. They are free. You can modify them. You can adopt them. You can host them. You don't have, there's no money that, that changes hands. And yet, uh, without support and without direct kind of attention to knowing about those things and understanding how to adopt them, what we see in open source software and in, in open content and open textbooks is that they just don't get adopted at the rate that you think they should be or would be. And so let me give you a quick example. Uh, in my state, uh, I told you our textbooks are 10 years out of date. <coughs> They're only available in paper. Uh, the kids are not allowed to keep the books at the end of the year. There's no digital versions and you're not allowed to write in the books. So what kind of educational resource is that? That's just stupid. And why do we have, why do we have uh, that when I can, or my state could take CK12 books and modify them and use them at no cost, at least in our high school math and science mm. courses, right? How can we be so stupid? And so we ask these questions, but then nothing gets done. And the reality is, is without somebody that's, that's a champion in the school district or, you know, where there's a concerted effort to think about this stuff and sit down and do the dirty work of, it's not dirty work, it's exciting, fun work, 
but it's hard. And sitting down with teachers and saying, okay, welcome. Do you know that your resources are 10 years out of date? How do you feel about that? Oh, not very good? Well, let's talk about open educational resources. Uh, did you know that you can modify these? Did you know that they're up to date? Did you know that they're available in five digital formats? Did you know we can print them for $3 and your students can keep them? And wouldn't that be cool if your students could, de could develop a library of resources as they move through your school? Teachers in schools <coughs> are falling over themselves for opportunities like this, but they need help. Same thing is true in higher education. So Lumen Learning essentially is uh, saying, look, there are no uh, Red Hats or other companies like them in the open education space, uh, and there need to be because uh, colleges and universities need help. So that's essentially what they're doing, and they're going to charge for their services. So they'll go in and they'll uh, get a contract essentially to come in and say, <laughs> we will work with your faculty, we'll work with your students, your librarians, with your administration to help you understand open educational resources, including open textbooks, and we will, um, we will help you evaluate them, we will help you modify them, we will teach you about what open licensing means and how you abide by those licenses and how you give proper attribution, uh, and we're here, we're your partners in this. And yes, you'll pay us a little money, but it's a whole lot less money than what your students are paying today for textbooks. And so in the end, the net savings to the institution in financial aid that's given to go buy textbooks, and the net savings to the students in their out-of-pocket costs for textbooks uh, will be significant. Uh, and it will, and those savings can be yielded in the first semester of courses. So that's the idea of Lumen Learning. Um, it's just one company. There will be more, and we need more. Uh, one is not enough. Uh, David and Kim are wonderful. Uh, they're very smart people. They're going to do a great job, but they're two people and they've got a small staff. They cannot help the world. They can't even help most of the community colleges in the United States. And so, uh, although I'm sure they will try. <laughs> so I, uh, I, I hope that answered your question. Uh, let me look down here. <laughs> Kelvin says, are there any good examples of sustainability plans for OER resources after the initial seed money runs out? So this is a, an excellent question and <laughs> is frankly one of my pet peeves. And so forgive me if I get a little testy in my answer. Let me also put CC's website up here since we've been talking about open licensing so much. I would be remiss if I didn't put my own organization site on. So sustainability. <clears throat> sustainability, the idea is, is that the project has uh, a revenue stream and uh, attention paid on it and resources and champions to carry the project forward. <coughs> that, that's, the, that's generally what people mean when they say sustainability. Uh, and you are absolutely right that many open education projects uh, are started with a grant and in many cases are sustained by foundation or grant money and that's always a precarious position to be in uh, and no question about that. One of the major points that I hope you got about open policy is that open policy really seeks to switch that conversation. So. Uh, the, the traditional conversation and where your question really comes from is thinking about an open education project or an open education initiative as a pilot. It's something that we're doing over there. It's not really part of our main activities. It might be interesting. We should probably, you know, we should experiment with it. But, um, you know, when the money runs out, the thing is done. And if it can't figure out how to make money on its own, that's too damn bad. Uh, it's not sustainable. See, we just showed that open can't be sustainable. Now, that's one way of looking at sustainability of, of OER uh, or open access or open anything else. I don't think that's the right way to look at it. Um, let me give you an example. Let me put up one more project here. <coughs> 
So in my last job before I came to Creative Commons, I was the director of e-learning and open education for the Washington Community and Technical Colleges, and we had this conversation. And we looked at our uh, system. This is 500,000 students <coughs> in community colleges in the state of Washington, 34 colleges, lots of courses, lots and lots of courses. And uh, we looked at uh, students who were dropping out because they couldn't afford textbooks. We looked at uh, the fact that faculty were not uh, sharing across uh, the courses, the same courses that were being taught across the 34 colleges. So lots and lots of sections of Spanish 101, lots of sections of Statistics 101, lots of sections of English composition, right? Everybody takes these courses. Or, hundreds, or in our case, tens of thousands of students take all of those courses. And we decided a couple things. We decided that it was not okay that the average cost of textbooks was $175 in our highest enrolled courses. We decided that it was not okay that the that faculty who are paid with state funds were not sharing uh, with each other and that there was a lot of redundancy and inefficiency in the system. Uh, we decided that it was not okay for students not to have access to state-of-the-art, cutting-edge content and materials as they learned in these highest enrolled courses. And we decided that it was not okay to have haves and have-nots in the system, um, given that some of the colleges had more money than other colleges and, and had more resources to produce great courses. Um, and so we built this. And this is called the Open Course Library. And it is, in essence, the entire core curriculum. So it's the highest enrolled 82 courses <coughs> in community colleges, which, by the way, are the highest enrolled 82 courses in all of your education institutions. Uh, and we made them all open. We took uh, generously from anybody around the world who was willing to share their open content with us. We modified those resources. Anything we built, we put a Creative Commons attribution license on it. Uh, so that was the project. Here's my point. My point is when people asked us, how are you going to sustain that project? Our answer was this. We said, it is our job as public community colleges, as educators, to provide the very best educational resources to our students to keep those resources updated. And if we're not doing that, then we should hang up our hat and get out of business and let somebody else do it who can do it better. And therefore, this is not an open education resources pilot. This is our core project. This is what we do. This is our mission. And therefore, we use base budget ongoing to maintain this project. And in fact, this is the foot in the door. We really need to have broader conversations <coughs> about sharing more than just these 82 courses. And so the system passed an open policy, back to open policy, and said, uh, henceforth, if you take money from the system, you will share uh, what you build. And so I'll type this in the chat window. If you go to Google and type in SBCTC, open policy, so copy and paste that into Google and you'll find the open policy. <coughs> and so my point is, is that part of the open policy conversation is to switch that sustainability argument around and to say, yes, today the default on publicly educate, on the public educate, sorry, the default today on publicly funded educational resources is closed. That's what we do today. That's wrong. The default on publicly education, educated resources or education resources should be open. And the enclosed or proprietary should be the exception. Right? We should start to do what California and British Columbia are doing. They've stepped back and they've said, what do we need for our citizens, for our students, in terms of the textbooks that they need to be successful in higher education? That's the question. What do we need? Well, we need these highest enrolled courses. How are we going to get there uh, with our state money in the most cost-effective, efficient, 
high quality way? Their answer is to take public money, put it out, make it available for the very best, smartest minds in the world to produce those books. The copyright will be held by the state of California, by the province of British Columbia, and they will put a Creative Commons attribution license on those books and make them freely available. Right? That's how we make open education sustainable, is we get open policies passed. That's why we're starting the Open Policy Network. That's why getting open policies passed in your countries are so critical, because that's where the money is. The money is in the public sphere. And if we can start to get open policies enacted, sustainability ceases to become a problem or an issue for open education, for open access, and other open efforts. How can somebody become an Open Policy Fellow? Well, if you're interested in this topic and you uh, have some time and some expertise in this area, send me an email. Let me uh, go back to the slides here. I think I have, uh, let me go to the last slide. Maybe I have a slide. That doesn't look very good. Let me, <laughs> let me just type in my email here. I am Cable at creativecommons.org. There, I typed it in the chat window. And if you want to follow me on Twitter, I am at Seagreen. <coughs> if you like these types of conversations and you'd like to stay up to date on the resources, uh, that's the best place to get into my brain and know what I'm thinking and who I'm connected to and, and what's happening around open policy and open education and open textbooks. Uh, everything that I come across, I throw it up uh, on my Twitter feed and my Identica feed and uh, Creative Commons blog, et cetera. So, but at, at C Green is the best place to, to follow me. Uh, let me stop talking here since we've got three minutes left. I'll look to see if there are any other questions. Yep, your own professional development. Ah, so let me pitch one other thing real quick since you're talking about your own professional development. So uh, yesterday, we launched the School of Open. If you go to schoolofopen.org, or I'll just put the direct link in here. <coughs> put the link in there, and let me also put up the blog post, which has uh, some more detailed info on it. Here you go. So the idea of the Open Policy Network is uh, to the extent that there are open policy opportunities in the world that need help to be successful, the network will be there to provide resources, expertise, consulting to get those policies across the finish line and implemented so that all of us can benefit from publicly funded resources. Right? The idea of the School of Open is there are a lot of people like Kelvin around the world who are very interested in these topics but need a little uh, education, a little professional development <laughs> to get up to speed. So uh, including myself. So uh, I know uh, a lot about open policy and open educational resources. I know about this much about open science and open data, and I know about this much about open software, but I, I could really use an education in those three areas. That's what the School of Open is designed to do. These are free courses. They, of course, are Creative Commons licensed. So if you want to take the content and use them elsewhere, feel free. <laughs> Many of these courses are self-paced. Uh, several of them are facilitated. And uh, they are all avail available at schoolofopen.org. These are hosted uh, on the peer-to-peer -peer university platform. You can see the first set of courses um, that are in the launch include Copyright for Educators, uh, a course that was created in the U.S., another one that was uh, focused on Australia and Australian mm -hmm. copyright law. Uh, we've also got one, Creative Commons for K-12 educators. This is for primary uh, educators. And then we've got an introduction to uh, uh, writing Wikipedia articles. <coughs> we will be providing uh, courses in everything about open eventually. So if you have an idea about open, um, I know some of our friends from the Open Courseware Consortium are. 
I want a course in the School of Open about if my university wants to move to open courseware, how do we do it, right? We need that course. And I'm going to put the screws in my friend Igor and, uh, and Una to, to spearhead that one. So anybody can build a course. There is a, a review process of getting it into the School of Open, but it's the community that decides whether or not it's good enough and what revisions need to be made before it goes in. Of course, everything in peer-to-peer -peer university is under a CC BY SA license. Uh, I think we're out of time, so I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. I want to thank everybody for your interest. Uh, please stay tuned. Uh, uh, pay attention to the, the uh, School of Open and the Open Policy Network, and uh, we hope that you'll stay involved with, with all this. And don't forget, put Creative Commons licenses on your works so that everybody else can uh, take advantage of your knowledge and your brilliance and will collectively make the world a better place. Thank you very much.